Transvision 2022, organisé par l'Association française transhumaniste. Just, uh, I was happy to offer to do, um, take the place of moderator because my studies are in uh, agroecology and wildlife studies with a focus on uh, animal welfare. And so I think uh, the first step to, to get things going would just be to ask each of you about your overall global vision of how you think the role of animals and wildlife in even ecology will, what will the role be in a possible transhumanist future? So maybe um, we already, on Adija, we heard you speak yesterday, so maybe we can start with uh, David. Thank you. Um, yes, just a little bit of context. Uh, yeah, what is transhumanism in a nutshell? I define it, yeah, super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. Super happiness being my focus. And the Transhumanist Declaration of 1998, uh, 2009, reaffirmed, commits us to the well-being of all sentience, i.e. not just uh, human well-being, but also non-human animals. Now, I suspect a lot of people uh, um, will mentally be thinking, yes, we're all against against uh, animal cruelty, animal suffering, but we have more important issues to worry about than non-human animals. And I'd like to, yeah, just by way of scene setting, push back here in that non-human animals, both in factory farms, slaughterhouses, and in nature, are as sentient and demonstrably sapient as infants and pre-linguistic toddlers. Uh, with all that that entails, I um, mean, you can tell someone that, yeah, a pig is, or a zebra is as sentient as a toddler, but will it stop them eating their bacon sandwich? In many cases, pro probably not. Uh, in the case of something like, let's say, give an example, a long finned pilot whale, a long finned pilot whale, actually, a, a dolphin has almost twice as many. Uh, neurons in the neocortex, much larger mesolimbic dopamine system, a long fin, fin pilot whale may be more conscious, more sentient uh, than humans. So non-human animal suffering matters. Um, in the context of the abolitionist project of getting rid of all forms of suffering. In the case of humans, I think the way to go forward is universal access to pre-implantation genetic screening, counseling, counseling, CRISPR genome editing, what used to be called eugenics, but with, uh, with, the, with, with the vision of a world without involuntary suffering and life based on gradients of bliss. But the abolitionist project, as I said, extends beyond humanity to non-humans. Any, um, any uh, approach to tackling the problem of wild animal suffering is probably going to be futile as long as humans are systematically hurting, harming and killing non-human animals in factory farms and slaughterhouses. And one of the definitions of transhumanism is technical solutions to ethical problems. And realistically, the reason why factory farms and slaughterhouses are going to be phased out this century is not moral persuasion on its own. It's going to be the cultured meat revolution, essentially. Uh, and yeah, I, I think we should be enacting legislation that... Uh, that outlaws slaughterhouses kicking in in, let's say, 10 uh, in 2035 or something like that, that is a tremendous incentive to, uh, yeah, essentially to, to develop, commercialize cultured meat and animal products so we can get the de death factories shot and outlawed. Anyway, this is just the preface to what we're specifically going to be talking on in this session, which is wild animal suffering. Naively, the problem of wild animal suffering is completely intractable because, you know, to give a, an obvious example, let's say you have, uh, you know, there are, there are starving herbivores in winter. You try to feed the starving herbivores. The upshot of this is a population explosion, Malthusian catastrophe, more starvation, more predators, more suffering. Um, however, all these problems are, in principle, 
fixable. And one of the things that I've done over over the years is drawn up blueprints. Okay, pretty fanciful blueprints to how we can actually get rid of non-human suffering uh, in 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 nature. For example, something one well, instead of starvation and predation. It's going to be possible to use cross-species fertility regulation. In the case of large terrestrial vertebrates, one can use something like immunocontraception. In the case of small, fast breeders, whether in Amazonia or deep marine ecosystems, one can use tunable synthetic gene drives. Uh, essentially, the whole biosphere is programmable and the level of suffering is an adjustable parameter. And tweaking even a handful of genes could massively reduce the burden of suffering in the world, uh, not just in humans, but in non-human animals. Um, in the case of something like physical pain, yeah, hundreds of different genes, thousands of alleles involved, but there is one so-called, you know, the, the volume knob for pain, the master switch, the SCN9A gene. Uh, yeah, dozens of different mutations ranging from nonsense mutations that abolish the capacity to feel pain to other mutations involving high or low pain thresholds. If we're serious about tackling the problem of wild animal suffering, we can use synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance to spread benign versions of SCN9A across entire species remotely. We're not going to run out of computer power. Every cubic meter of the planet is computationally accessible to micromanagement and control which can be orwellian or can be benign can be used for the purposes of a a pan species welfare state um before passing on the the microphone i mean one obvious problem when it comes to wild animal suffering is predators what should we do about obligate carnivores um i mean the bible for example isaiah talks about you know, the, the peaceable kingdom, a world where the, 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 the lion and the wolf will lie down and the lamb, but it leaves out the technical details. How is this going to be feasible? One option, it's not the option that I think is sociologically credible, is to phase out obligate predators altogether. And But most people are aghast at the idea of a world without lions. Uh... Therefore, we need to consider other options using everything from stop gaps such as uh, cultured catnip laced it, uh, cultured meat to, uh, ge to genetic uh, uh, tweaking. But essentially, yeah, the whole biosphere is programmable. We have to decide how much suffering we want to exist in the living world and what is the long term future of sentience do we want a world in which sentient beings continue to hurt harm and kill each other or do we want a world in which all sentient beings can flourish well thank you for that um would you like to continue on Oh, hello, everybody. So I'm going to switch in French because my accent in French is better than my English accent in, in English. Uh, il est difficile d'ajouter quelque chose à ce que uh, David vient de uh, dire, qu'il a, et je crois qu'il a fait un, un survol uh, complet de, de la problématique. Uh, le, la perspective du, du transhumanisme, c'est bien sûr pour augmenter la, la quantité de plaisir dans, dans la biosphère. C'est pas uniquement uh, quelque chose qui concerne uh, que les humains. Et, et c'est à ça qu'il faut uh, réfléchir. Et donc, uh, effectivement, les, la, la condition des animaux domestiques est et une des priorités euh, très faciles à, à régler d'une certaine manière par l'abolition des, des abattoirs. Et je pense que cette perspective doit vraiment être intégrée dans la réflexion du, du transhumanisme. Mais au-delà de, de la question des, des abattoirs, bien sûr, la question de la vie sauvage est, est fondamentale et il faut euh, intervenir pour euh, augmenter, alors diminuer la souffrance, mais aussi ce qui est important, augmenter le, le, le plaisir. C'est toujours cette idée-là, c'est pas uniquement de lutter contre la euh, souffrance, mais d'augmenter la, la qualité de la, de la vie et la, euh, le degré de, de jouissance euh, de la vie. Et donc, ça demande une intervention massive. Et alors il y, a, il y a bien sûr un problème politique, c'est la, la réactance à ces idées-là. Ces idées-là peuvent être 
très très mal accepté et si je voulais ajouter un, un point par rapport à ce que vient de dire David, c'est qu'il va falloir réussir à convaincre la société qu'il faut intervenir dans la nature et ça ne ça, ça, ça devrait pas être facile puisque les idées dominantes actuellement sont au contraire de préserver la nature. La, la force du mouvement environnementaliste ou du mouvement écologiste euh, se, se, se repose sur cette idée que la nature est une, une bonne chose, que, euh, que la nature est un lieu équilibré, que la nature est un lieu d'harmonie et que les humains euh, ont le tort d'intervenir dans la nature et que tout impact dans les mouvements environnementalistes, tout impact de l'humain sur la nature est vu de façon négative. Alors, dans cette perspective-là, l'idée d'intervenir dans la nature pour diminuer la souffrance et pour diminuer aussi, de façon très importante, les actes de prédation, peut être vue par la société comme une hérésie. Et on peut rapidement se, se faire traiter de, de fou si on, on aborde ces euh, idées en dehors de, de cercles comme euh, celui-ci. Donc, je pense que là, il y a aussi un, un travail d'acceptation de, de ces idées-là en montrant que les idées environnementalistes ou écologistes d'une manière générale en, en voulant préserver la nature ne nous permettront pas euh, de développer ces idées d'intervention dans la nature pour, pour diminuer la, la souffrance. Merci beaucoup. Um, is that working? Yeah. Uh, so James, like you to get your opinion on that, please. <laughs> well, <coughs> Um, I don't know that transhumanism actually has a distinctive position on animal welfare. We definitely have a pre predominance of what we call personhood ethicists, of, of people who believe that personhood is, the, is a central characteristic of, of moral consideration and that that would expand beyond the human. Robots could be persons, aliens could be persons, and certain animals are persons. Um, and I think most of us would agree that while suffering has or pain has moral significance, that personhood or self-awareness is a multiplier of the moral significance of suffering. So that in other words, a human suffering is more significant than ant suffering or fish suffering. Um, I think there's also an interesting dilemma with the idea of engineering pain out of animals because it would actually remove the moral significance of domesticated animals being in um, animal husbandry. Uh, I once asked Peter Singer if I could sneak up behind a chicken and wring its neck really fast before it suffered, would that be okay? And he said, yes. Um, so, you know, if, if you could engineer chickens, cows, pigs to not suffer, then what would be the problem? I mean, this is kind of, you know, halfway towards um, our synthetic meat. If, we, you know, synthetic meat would not have neurons in it, so it wouldn't suffer. And if you could get halfway there with, a, you know, a headless pig or something like that, then it would be okay. Um, I've been more interested, rather than engineering pain out of the animal kingdom, I've been more interested in the question of uplift, because I consider our relationship, especially with the animals that we have under our control, domesticated animals, um, animal husbandry, and zoos, the animals that we have under our control, we have some obligation towards, and especially towards those that have higher cognitive functions that are more self-aware and have more personhood. And I think um, giving them eventually the capacity to make their own case, to, to argue their own uh, position and, and desires is something that we do have a moral obligation towards, as well as to reduce the unnecessary suffering in the animal kingdom. I'm less enthusiastic, both for practical reasons, but principally for practical reasons, with the ideas of engineering the, the wild kingdom. I think our principal obligation there is to preserve ecosystems. We obviously um, are destroying them very rapidly, and so um, our efforts to uh, preserve ecological diversity around the world is, I think, the first order of business, and then after that, perhaps uh, putting nanobots in all their brains so that they don't suffer any more. Thank you. I really like what you said about ecosystems. Um, so ecosystems being a, a living system with living organisms interacting with each other. Uh, my question is, how do you envision uh, nature or ecosystems if we alter to such a high degree uh, the genetic nature of animals? You're ready for it. Um. Before going gung-ho and releasing synthetic gene drives uh, on nature, one would 
do pilot studies, presumably in self-contained artificial biospheres, artificial ecosystems. Uh, and yeah, I mean, this will iron out uh, teething problems. I mean, in terms of I mean, I touched on the issue of uh, pain, there's tremendous variability in pain sensitivity, pain thresholds. And essentially, f for both humans and human animals, we can effectively choose the level of pain sensitivity. And, bef and before getting rid of physical pain altogether, which will be possible in favor of a more civilized signaling system it makes sense to ensure that yeah uh, non-human animals as well as humans have extremely high pain tolerance while preserving the function of nociception in the case of something like hedonic tone um, depression seems to be a you know, frightful disorder depressive disorder hundreds of uh, yeah hundreds of millions of people worldwide are clinically or subclinically depressed social and human animals get depressed too. It seems to be an adaptation to group living. Uh, depression is associated with subordination and defeat. And yeah, it's going to be possible to tweak a handful of genes implicated in hedonic tone and create hypothymic non-humans. Um, one uh, point that James uh, mentioned this, and I think this is a question of complicity. Until very recently, uh, yeah, essentially, a uh, problem of wild animal suffering was, you know, like the second law of thermodynamics. One simply couldn't do anything about it. But like it or not, with power comes complicity, and we can effectively choose how much suffering we want to exist in the in in the world i mean it's uh, um so um though yes i care in one sense about ecosystems ecosystems aren't unified subjects of experience ecosystems only matter in so far as they impact on the lives of sentient beings uh, and yeah, humans already massively interfere with ecosystems worldwide. So the question isn't should we or shouldn't we uh, intervene in nature? The question is what principles should govern our I interventions? Uh, and even if you don't think our overriding moral obligation is to minimize, mitigate and prevent suffering, most ethical systems will give some weight and generally a lot of weight to minimizing pain and suffering. And yeah, we're living in the in the last century where suffering is inevitable. And yeah, if, if we want to create a world based on gradients of bliss, uh, genetic engineering, germline engineering offers the potential to, to do so. Uh, yeah, I haven't even touched on the potential pitfalls, which are many and varied. But if we are thinking about the long-term future of sentience on Earth, the long-term future of our forward light cone, yeah, we've got to take a decision. Do we want to retain the, the traditional pleasure-pain axis or do we want a more civilized signaling system, life based on gradients of intelligent bliss? And life based on intelligent bliss can be as radical or as conservative as you want because one of the advantages of recalibrating the hedonic treadmill is that in principle at any rate it can conserve your existing values and preference architectures and i think yeah though this is it's taking us beyond specifically the problem of wild animal suffering uh that yeah we we we, we, we want to have an architecture of mind based on gradients of intelligent bliss thank you did you want to add something to that comme tout à l'heure, je, je ferai un, un complément sur, euh, puisque la question portait sur, sur les écosystèmes et, et les devoirs qu'on a envers les écosystèmes. Je pense que c'est cette idée qu'il faut, 
je voudrais mettre en avant, c'est que nous n'avons pas de devoir envers les écosystèmes et euh, on parle souvent dans la société de la destruction des, des écosystèmes actuellement. Je pense que le mot déjà destruction euh, a une charge euh, morale et il faudrait beaucoup plus parler de transformation des écosystèmes. Actuellement, la société en général, les humains transforment les écosystèmes et il ne faut pas voir ça comme une, une destruction, il faut voir ça donc comme une transformation et la, la question qu'il faut se poser c'est est-ce euh, que cette transformation des écosystèmes, on pourrait pas l'orienter d'une façon positive d'un point de vue éthique. Et je pense que si on, on, on pense en termes de transformation positive des écosystèmes, il faut trouver une direction, et je ne vois pas d'autre direction que celle qui consiste effectivement à diminuer la souffrance au sein de ces écosystèmes ou d'augmenter la quantité de, de plaisir. Donc je pense... Euh, qui, il faut vraiment sortir de cette idée que les écosystèmes sont des, des lieux à, à, à préserver et, et je dirais il faut faire même attention aux mots, on parle aussi beaucoup par exemple d'effondrement de la euh, biodiversité dans notre société et tout le monde associe avec cette idée de d'effondrement une idée de catastrophe or euh, l'effondrement de la diversité n'est pas forcément une catastrophe, la, la question qu'il faut se poser à chaque fois quand il y a une évolution d'un écosystème ou quand il y a une évolution de la biodiversité, est-ce est que cette cette évolution de la biodiversité ou cette évolution ou cette transformation des écosystèmes ne pourrait pas apporter plus de euh, bonheur à tous les êtres sentients qui, qui font partie de ces écosystèmes. Et c'est vers ça qu'il faut travailler, donc sortir un peu du, du paradigme, comme je le disais euh, tout à l'heure, de la préservation de, de la nature à, au sein de laquelle on vit. Merci. Just one brief comment. <clears throat> on the Great Ape Project, which we, I think uh, Didier mentioned, um, a decade ago, my think tank, IET, we sponsored a conference at Yale on the relationship between the transhumanist agenda and um, non-human rights. And there is an organization in, in the States, it's a global organization, called Non-Human Rights Project, which is the successor to the Great Ape Project. And um, they have been suing on behalf of uh, elephants and dolphins and great apes who are in ca captivity in various zoos or, uh, you know, sometimes owned by individuals, um, suing on behalf to get them their freedom, to, to recognize that um, these kinds of animals have certain rights comparable to human rights. Um, I think this is a critical issue that transhumanists should embrace because it will have a dramatic impact if we can reduce the anthropocentrism of human rights law and broaden it to the concept of personhood rights. Um, it will have a dramatic effect as we begin to change, as human beings begin to modify ourselves, because then the question will be, well, you modified yourself so much that you're not a human anymore, so human rights don't apply to you, or, you know, you've got uh, too much computer in your brain to be a human anymore. So we don't want to be in that situation. So we need to be defining what persons are. Not all animals are persons, only some animals are persons. Um, so that is a very limited set of the animal rights question, but I think it's a very transformative one. Thank you. Um, just a question about how do you envision um, the future having um, having a, the ability to provide sustainable agriculture in a um, in a long-term way based on, um, I assume, that which you would be for a plant-based diet. How do, you, how do you envision that? Um, yes, mercifully, it seems that a plant-based diet is associated with lower all-cause mortality. Um, this, yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty marginal. Uh, and it's much, much safer to be uh, a, a lazy, lazy meat eater than a lazy vegan. But if, if essentially you, you eat prudently and sensible than other things being equal, uh, yeah, uh, you'll live longer as a vegan or a, ve a, a vegetarian. In practice, I see the cultured meat revolution as, as superseding a, a lot of forms of, uh, of, of traditional agriculture. Presumably, uh, yes, a lot of arable land will continue to be used uh, feeding uh, people at the moment. Uh, this is one misguided argument against uh, veganism and vegetarianism. It's sometimes said, ah, but what about all the invertebrates and small rodents that are killed in, in uh, or have their lives disrupted by uh, uh, plant-based agriculture? 
it's more uh, efficient, such as the thermodynamics of a food chain, to feed grain and soya products directly to humans rather than to non-human animals whom humans factory farm and then and then slaughtered. Um, yeah, in, uh, for the foreseeable future, some kind of high-tech Jainism, uh, uh, by foreseeable I mean the next few decades, is probably simply utopian dreaming. But in, in the long run, yeah, it's going to be possible to help even uh, sort of small rodents, insects, uh, protect them, uh, it, it, even though, uh, yeah, obviously uh, arable land will continue to be used for crops. Sorry, that was a rather ragged no, answer. <laughs> Oui, alors par rapport à, à l'agriculture, effectivement, une agriculture euh, qui, qui prendrait en compte euh, la souffrance euh, doit être une agriculture euh, végane. Mais euh, je pense aussi, puisqu'on on est là, dans, on parle beaucoup de l'augmentation donc de, de l'humain dans le transhumanisme. Je pense qu'il faut aussi parler aussi de l'augmentation des, des végétaux. C'est la question euh, importante, donc bien sûr, des transformations génétiques des, des animaux. On parle de transformation génétique des, des humains pour euh, euh, augmenter leur quantité de plaisir ou celle des, des animaux. Mais je pense que euh, puisque les plantes euh, nous en consommons. Je pense qu'il faut aussi les, les transformer pour qu'elles nous apportent plus de nutriments dont on a besoin. Et puis, il ne faut pas oublier que ce qui pourrait être très intéressant aussi, c'est de transformer euh, les plantes pour que les carnivores actuellement soient attirés pour manger des, des plantes. Je ne sais pas à quel point on peut, euh, quelque part, donner euh, l'appétit des, des, des plantes à des lions, ce qui permettrait euh, d'éviter aussi beaucoup de, de souffrance. Donc, euh, transformer euh, toute cette agriculture. Il y a toute un, une ingénierie de la végétation à faire pour que quelque part, là aussi, on, on diminue la quantité de euh, souffrance. I don't have much more to add, except that um, I, I think that our proximate political issues um, have to do with reducing the unnecessary suffering in domesticated animals. And so the, I think that's where we should be focusing. And, and we have. Uh, there have been many laws passed in different countries and in the United States and different states um, to reduce unnecessary suffering in uh, domesticated farming. Um, and so... After that, yes, I'm, we, we actually published an essay 15 years ago in the IET by George Dvorsky, who proposed the same thing that you're talking about now. He was talking about engineering suffering out of the animal kingdom. Um, but I, I think if we go public with this issue right now, it would be a little, little premature. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. It's really interesting for me to hear um, your perspectives and just talking about uh, the idea of lions eating grass and the amount of biomass that would require to feed all of the large predators and even considering deep ocean, as you mentioned earlier, David, and how we still haven't actually explored the whole ocean. So we don't actually know uh, all of what would be required. So I think maybe as transhumanists in, in this in this perspective, what do you think are the first steps we need to do in terms of public awareness? What do you think the most important thing uh, to do right now uh, to help the idea of reducing suffering? Um, I think all prospective parents worldwide should be offered access to pre-implantation genetic uh, screening, counseling, and soon genome uh, genome editing. I mean, the World Health Organization, its definition of health is inc ridiculously transhumanist. The World, Trans uh, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, social, emotional well-being. I mean, by that criterion, no sentient being in history has ever been healthy. And so to realize even an approximation of health as defined by the World Health Organization, essentially we're going to have to be trans, yeah, become transhuman. And the way to become <laughs> transhuman is to start editing our genetic source code. Sooner or later, if one talks about uh, this, the E-word crops up. Uh, eugenics. Um, 
how should transhumanists respond, you know, when someone asks, but do you advocate eugenics? I mean, one option is what you know, so-called linguistic reappropriation, if you think of the derogatory words uh, for gay uh, and black people that some that I mean, attempts to rehabilitate them. I've I've got a little website, uh, eugenics.org, ad advocating, you know, biohappiness revolution, reprogramming the biosphere. But it may be that the E word is simply, uh, yeah, too tainted by past abuse to use. Uh, genome reform is a, uh, yeah, is 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 more anodyne. But of course, critics will say, but you're supporting eugenics. Um, but yeah, so the nettle has to be grasped, essentially, that natural selection didn't design us to be happy, discontent, suffering in all its forms can be extremely genetically uh, fitness enhancing. But mastery of our source code and the impending reproductive revolution is going to change the nature of selection pressure itself. I mean, because, yeah, that... Whereas natural selection is blind and based on random variations, unnatural selection where, for example, prospective parents are choosing the genetic makeup of their kids in anticipation of the likely psychological behavioral effects and even a handful of tweaks yeah, by, by raising – uh, uh, yeah, hedonic set points so that we recalibrate the hedonic treadmill and that by raising pain thresholds we can massively reduce the burden of suffering in the world. Um, but any solution has to be not just technically feasible, it needs to be sociologically realistic and it can be very hard to gauge the Overton window of political acceptability 10 years, 50 years, let alone 150 or 500 years uh, from now. And I think the best one can do perhaps realistically is, is set out uh, the different options I mean, personally, for example, I'm I'm a so-called soft antinatalist. I can't see any moral justification for uh, creating yeah more more suffering in the world. But the future belongs to fanatical life lovers, and therefore, uh, yeah, uh, the way to fix the problem of suffering is to tackle the problem at root, which means genome reform. Oui, alors la, la, la question était l'urgence, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire dans une perspective transhumaniste euh, rapidement, je dirais, par rapport aux, aux animaux, je dirais, oui, c'est là, ce que disait James, la priorité, ça doit être euh, de s'occuper de, de la souffrance non nécessaire chez, chez les animaux et celle qu'on inflige en, en premier, je suis tout à fait d'accord, et, et c'est pour ça que je dirais qu'il faut euh, abolir les, euh, la consommation euh, carnée, puisque c'est euh, une consommation de, de, qui n'est pas nécessaire. Donc dans ce sens-là, ça serait le, le premier acte euh, à faire, donc de changer l'alimentation et de ou de devrer pour changer l'alimentation dans la société humaine. Mais aussi toutes ces idées dont on, on, on débat là actuellement, comme David vient de parler de la fenêtre d'Overton, je pense qu'il faut aussi, effectivement, socialement, ce n'est pas euh, encore accepté, mais il faut déjà en discuter, même si c'est pas forcément, bien sûr, la priorité de transformer actuellement le de de, de, re, de transformer complètement la biosphère de, de notre euh, planète pour qu'il y ait moins de souffrance, si c'est à la fois pas encore faisable pratiquement et c'est pas encore acceptable euh, socialement, il faut commencer à en parler, donc ouvrir la fenêtre d'Overton pour quelque part les idées euh, se diffusent, ça me paraît aussi important. Donc il y a, sur un plan pratique, il, y a, il faut agir là où on peut agir et donc c'est en priorité sur les animaux euh, domestiques dès maintenant, mais je pense qu'au niveau du débat d'idées, euh, il faut bien sûr euh, aller voir plus loin et commencer à faire comprendre aux gens que euh, nous avons une responsabilité puisqu'on va avoir le pouvoir d'agir sur le monde sauvage de plus en plus grand. Il faut cette responsabilité, il faut faire donner aux gens ou leur faire prendre conscience qu'ils ont une responsabilité vis-à-vis -vis de ce monde euh, sauvage. Et je pense que ce genre de discussion participe peut-être de cette prise de conscience. Yeah, um, did, you, did you have a final word you wanted to say before we open for questions? It's a really interesting topic that's very vast and uh, I think definitely looking at animal welfare of how we use animals now is a really important uh, thing to do because there are probably most of us who like eating a good steak now and then. Um. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Once I've uh, watched a TV demo, um, documentary about primates and uh, they were able to analyze the sound they were making, it doesn't work. And um, they, they could see, that because they, they taught this, uh, I don't remember, maybe they were bonobos, they, they had been taught uh, the use of the alphabet so they, they could uh, exchange messages. And they also analyzed the sounds they were making when they were uh, making sounds. And it looked like words. So I, one of the questions uh, I wonder about is, uh, would there be uh, like a duty to enhance these apes or animals to make them able to, to talk because they don't have the ph physiological uh, ability to, to talk, but it seems that they would like to, to, to use words uh, uh, with their, yes, with their, I don't know these parts. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have had debates occasionally within the transhumanist movement uh, about uplift, which is, uh, this fits into that category. And I think one of the interesting questions that came up in regards to that is if we were to increase the intellectual capacities and the communication capacities of animals. So for instance, uh, David Brin, in his famous uplift novels, he proposed that you could put some cybernetic implants for dolphins so that you could translate their communication into language. Um, I think that's probably non-controversial that that would be an interesting thing to do. And we've already got some experiments with dogs, I guess, that, you know, to translate barks into communication. Um, but to actually genetically modify an animal so that it had more of the cognitive and communication capacities. Um, some people have claimed that that would be a form of cultural imperialism. And, um, I, you know, if, if you uplifted a chimpanzee, one of the frequent things that they do when they argue is they throw poo at each other. So, you know, um, I, I wouldn't want to be in a classroom with someone who had that argumentative style and would forcing them not to throw poo, would that be cultural imperialism of our an an anthropocentric kind, you know? Um, so I do think there's some interesting, very interesting questions. But I do believe in the, in the future that we will have uplifted animals and that we have some obligation to uplift animals, at least those that are already in captivity, not necessarily those in the wild. Now, Nick Bostrom's response to this, I think is interesting, is like, if you have the choice to create a new creature and you choose to make a creature that is an uplifted animal, aren't you actually creating a disabled human being, right? But if you're putting human genes or human characteristics into these animals in order to make them more human, why not just make a human and make a better human, right? Um, so I do think we do have a problem there. That's like, if we're gonna put resources into the, these kinds of projects, do we wanna focus on uplifting animals or uplifting human beings? Um, moi, j'avais une question concernant, euh, d'un point de vue évolutionniste, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un intérêt à euh, la souffrance Parce que j'imagine que si elle est là, c'est qu'il y a eu un intérêt à ce qu'elle apparaisse. Et donc, euh, est-ce que, en cherchant à l'éliminer, on, on ne risquerait pas de perdre le, certains intérêts qu'il y a eu, qu il, qu il a eu à, à ce qu'elle existe Et deuxième point, sur euh, l'édition génomique que David a mentionné à plusieurs reprises, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas un risque de euh, limiter la diversité euh, euh, bah, génétique, en fait, finalement, en, en se disant, eh bien, tel, 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 tel être, il ne faut pas qu'il naisse parce qu'il va beaucoup souffrir, euh, alors qu'en fait, s'il était né, ça aurait pu participer à, à cette génération chaotique de la vie qui permet qu'il y ait des, nouvelles, des phénomènes d'émergence et tout ça qui apparaissent après pour... pour Enfin, je, je, sais, je, pense que, je pense que la question est, est, est claire. Je sais. Il y avait deux questions, du coup. Um, yes, well, here's this argument. Some forms of genetic diversity, I would argue, are extremely uh, ethically undesirable, indeed morally indefensible. I mean, there are thousands of different versions of the cystic fibrosis allele, and the optimal level is zero, that by creating healthy offspring without terrible conditions like cystic fibrosis one actually increases their opportunity to flourish but in terms of yeah genetic diversity the reproductive revolution of designer babies human and non-human 
actually allows a far greater diverse, genetic diversity than would be possible under a regime of natural selection. Um, because whereas natural selection can't cross fitness gaps, uh, human designers can. And more generally, I would say that, yeah, one wants a fabulous diversity of wonderful states of consciousness. Uh, yeah, uh, rather than uh, a diversity of forms of, of, of suffering. And this will be technically optional uh, in future. Other things being equal, uh, the happiest people tend to have the most diverse range of experiences. They're sensation-seeking. They go out and explore. It's depressives who get stuck in a rut. Um, so... Although there are certainly risks in some forms of genetic monoculture, um, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, a, a reproductive revolution, more genetic diversity, but good diversity. Oh, so he's saying um, the fact that there exists suffering in an evolutionary framework, uh, don't you think there's a good reason for that because it exists? Is that yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, was there a good reason for smallpox because it existed? Uh, I mean, what isn't in question is that suffering in all its diverse forms can sometimes play a, often... Sorry. Uh, so, so, uh, that suffering can sometimes play uh, uh, a valuable or instructive role. The question is, is that role indispensable and we see from the revolution in ai silicon robot robotics programmable digital computers that essentially any form of unpleasant experience is dispensable as our machines you know, zombie machines progressively outperform humans in in ever more cognitive domains, uh, essentially the nasty raw feels of suffering are dispensable. Now, of course, we don't want to get rid of all the good things in life, but yeah, we need a more civilized signaling system. And yeah, they're not mutually exclusive. One option is, is, is neuroprostheses. The other is uh, information sensitive gradients of, of, of bliss. Um, just David and I, um, I mean, I've had a conversation in my head with you, not as often in person as I would like, but um, with my grappling with the question of moral enhancement, I've become more of a eudaimonic theorist as opposed to, he opposed to hedonic. In other words, I, I'm now more of the opinion that um, a flourishing life is better than simply a pleasurable life, partly because I'm worried about the land of the lotus eaters problem, which is that if we make people too happy, they won't want to do anything. Um, and also because of the problem of hedonic adaptation, that um, if we, you know, you're in your model, you could have different gradients of bliss, but once you get used to the gradient of bliss between 11 and 12, then 11 becomes suffering and 12 becomes pleasure. And uh, that just seems to be an inevitable part of, of life. Can I very briefly reply? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth uh, taking course, case, case, case studies. Someone like Anders Sandberg, well, I think probably most people here know Anders Sandberg, quote, I do have a ridiculously high hedonic, hedonic set point. Um, yeah, Anders is, yeah, fabulously productive, high social responsibility, and yet he loves life. He really does. And he really does. Um, and just as sadly, there are some people who spend their lives chronically depressed and in pain. There are some people with a much higher hedonic set point who, yeah, who, who every day is a wonderful day. And a first step is to ratchet up hedonic range and hedonic set points uh, so that everyone can become hypothymic. I mean, it would then be possible to, you know, to engineer gradients of, of superhuman, superhuman bliss. So hedonic adaptation, I would say, in one sense is desirable. One wants to retain information sensitivity, but one can do so with, within a much, much higher hedonic range than is, is, is typical today. 
James mentioned eudaimonia. I'm never entirely clear what eudaimonia uh, is or what its biological substrates are. So long as it doesn't involve su- involuntary suffering, then uh, then uh, then cool. But yeah, I really, really, really do think that we should get rid of the scourge of suffering. That just as we now take pain-free surgery for granted, that our successors will take pain-free life for granted too. Sorry, I'm talking um, for too long. And I think we have time for one last question. Is yes, that, uh, the, yes, the last question. Sorry for the other people who were asking. And the last question, 100 seconds maximum, of course. Voilà. Merci. Bon, euh, lutter contre la souffrance animale non nécessaire, si vous voulez, est, est incontestable et je pense incontesté. Mais euh, jusqu'où devons-nous penser à la place des animaux Et je, parce que je, j'ai l'air, et je, je crois, euh, comprendre comme si ce romantisme, ce mort-là queue, euh, il arrive dans les familles ou dans les couples où l'amour a, euh, nous amène à imposer à l'être aimé ce que nous nous aimons. Bon, jusqu'où pensons-nous comprendre et nous mettre à la place des animaux Merci. Bah, il faut toujours se, se mettre à, à la place des, des autres. Je pense qu'en toute façon, euh, l'éthique, dans une réflexion éthique, on, on va forcément se mettre à, à la place des autres, on va se mettre à la place des humains. Euh, la question, elle est simple. Pourquoi, si on se met à la place des humains pour voir ce qu'il ne faut pas leur faire subir, on peut de la même manière se mettre à la place des animaux pour voir ce qu'il ne faut pas leur faire subir. Et de la même façon, euh, sur les exemples qui ont été donnés tout à l'heure, pour euh, si on peut, en se mettant à la place des, de, d'humains qui ont euh, un seuil de plaisir un niveau de plaisir beaucoup plus grand que nous et on dit que ça serait préférable que de, tout le monde ait ce même niveau de plaisir au, au quotidien ben, je dirais, de la même façon on peut inclure les animaux dans cette réflexion je pense qu'il faut, la, la question sur les animaux ce qu'il faut bien comprendre c'est qu'il faut sortir l'idée que la réflexion éthique sur les animaux doit être différente de la réflexion éthique sur les humains euh, ce ne sont pas deux catégories les humains et les animaux ne sont pas deux catégories éthiques différentes toute réflexion éthique que l'on a sur les humains est applicable euh, aux, aux animaux ils sont comme nous des êtres euh, souffrants et de la même manière qu'on se projette dans les humains pour voir comment on peut améliorer euh, la condition humaine, je pense qu'il faut se projeter dans les animaux pour voir comment on peut euh, améliorer d'une manière générale la condition des êtres sentients Okay, I, I let you 10 seconds to reply, but really 10 seconds. Eh? Parce que bon, je, si je dis jusqu'où, c'est que eh, à un certain niveau, je suis très d'accord. Mais mais jusqu'où Ce qui veut dire que au delà je donne un petit exemple. Devons nous les, les vêtir Parce que on, on se vêtit. Hein? Les animaux ne se vêtissent pas. Pourquoi on n'y pense pas Si les animaux sont dans des situations où ils risquent de mourir de froid, je pense qu'il faut veiller à ce qu'ils ne meurent pas euh, de froid. No, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry, Siba, you are cheating. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot.